welcome to my mommy's podcast. This podcast is brought to you by SteadyMD, and I have a story to tell you about them. I love this concierge medicine company because they have an amazing team of doctors and they match you with one who shares your values and your health ideals. This way, your doctor knows your full medical history and is available anytime you need him or her for calls, video chat, or text questions, which is what I usually use. With their new family plan, you can ask questions about your kids, and this is where the story comes in. Last year, I could only just now finally talk about this because it was so traumatic. There was an outbreak of empatigo in our neighborhood, possibly from a water slide that all of the kids in the neighborhood played on. And if you don't know, empatigo is a type of staph infection on the skin, and it was bad. There were 30 kids with skin infections all at once. It was pitiful to witness, and they kept transferring it back and forth because it's highly contagious and can live on surfaces for weeks or months. So all of us were doing an extreme amount of laundry and cleaning and trying to stay on top of it. And all of my neighbors were having to take their kids to urgent care or to local doctors, and they were getting all kinds of opinions on the best type of treatment, ranging from multiple courses of oral antibiotics to use of topical antibiotic creams or both. Since I have not found a good doctor where we moved to yet, I was so grateful to have my steady MD doctor literally in my pocket on my phone. So while everyone else was sitting in doctor's offices for multiple hours and multiple visits to see a doctor, I was able to video chat with mine, share pictures of my kids, and get his advice instantly. He already knew my preference is to avoid oral antibiotics whenever possible, and he worked with me on a plan to tackle the impetigo naturally and to only use topical treatments and save oral antibiotics as a last ditch effort, which we did not have to use, thank goodness. He was really great at combining conventional methods using a little bit of topical ointment with natural methods and different baths that we used. He was on call for the several weeks of the healing process to make sure there were no complications. He checked in every day and he gave me peace of mind during a really stressful time. I've used them so many other times for little things that require peace of mind or even for bigger, does this need stitches or do we need to go to the ER type questions. I cannot recommend them highly enough and you should check them out at steadymd.com forward slash wellness mama to learn more. Again, that's steady, S T E A D Y M D.com forward slash wellness mama. This episode is brought to you by Kettle and Fire Bone Broth and Soups. I have used these products for years and I always keep my pantry well stocked. They have chicken bone broth, beef bone broth, and a new chicken mushroom bone broth, which is delicious. Those are all great as a base for soups or even just sipped on their own. But Kettle and Fire also now has tomato, butternut, and miso soups, which are often incorporated as part of a meal in our house. Their newest products are a grass-fed chili and a Thai chicken soup. These are great meals all on their own, and they make last-minute dinner so easy at my house. Their broths are made from grass-fed and pastured animal bones, and they're a great source of collagen and amino acids like proline and glycine. I incorporate collagen in some form every day, and Kettle and Fire makes it super tasty to do this. You can learn more. Go to kettleandfire.com forward slash wellnessmama and use the code wellnessmama20 to save 20% on your order. So again, Kettle and Fire, all spelled out K-E-T-T-L-E-A-N-D-F-I-R-E.com forward slash wellnessmama and make sure to use the code wellnessmama20 to save 20%. Hello, and welcome to the Wellness Mama podcast. I'm Katie from wellnessmama.com, and I am here today with Dr. Mark Kukazella, who I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly. He is an Air Force Reserve Lieutenant Colonel, a practicing family medicine doctor, a professor at West Virginia University School of Medicine, and he teaches continuing medical education courses on health, fitness, and running through HealthFitU. He developed the U.S. Air Force Efficient Running Program, and most impressively to me, he has run competitively for almost four decades and has logged more than 100 marathon and ultra marathon finishes. In fact, he now continues to compete and has logged an under three-hour marathon for 30 straight years. I don't think there's many people in the world who can say that they have done any of those things. 
His new book, Run for Your Life, summarizes the science and the soul of running, nutrition, and physical activity to help you maintain a vigorous life. And I'm super excited to jump in and talk to Dr. Mark about things like barefoot running, should our kids be wearing shoes, what is the role of movement and exercise in our life, and also to jump into nutrition with a doctor who actually values that side of things. So Dr. Mark, welcome and thank you for being here. Well, thank you, Katie, for having me on. It's finally a beautiful day here in West Virginia after I think it's been like a month of just solid rain. <laughs> Everything is flooded and now the sun is out. So it puts me in a good mood for the weekend. Awesome. Yeah, me too. It's sunny here and I'm super grateful as I look out the window and get to talk to you. And I don't feel like I can start with the bio like that and not ask you to lead off by just telling a little bit of your story, because I think it takes a tremendous amount of dedication and consistency and commitment to be able to say the things that I just said in your bio. And I'm so curious your path and how you came to all of those different aspects of your career and your life. Yeah, it's been many different paths, um, Katie. So, you know, it sounds like you have very active kids playing outside. And so I was a normal, you know, kind of neighborhood rodents, you know, when I was a kid, would just be outside, you know, digging holes everywhere and playing and active and played all the sports and, you know, got involved in running because I could actually run pretty well. And I stopped growing. Uh, I was a football player when I was little and, you know, was the running back, but, but the sport outgrew me. So in high school, I started to just run, which was probably good and bad because I, when I became a single sport athlete, you know, then I started to probably focus too much on that. And in a growing body doing any single sport, you know, for parents out there who culturally are driven to put your kids into elite travel soccer leagues at like age six, just have caution because I don't think that's a good thing. But mine was kind of self-inflicted. I, I got some early success running and I just loved it. I, you know, I probably had ADD, you know, before they would call it a medical condition and medicate it. So my, my drug of choice was running. You know, I, I, would, I was always the kid who just could not sit still. You know, I was uh, expelled from a couple grade schools, actually, because I would always get in trouble. And then I you know, went to the local Catholic school. And I, I think the fear of, of Sister Mary kind of made me toe the line. But unless I could get out and run around, um, I, was, I was a problem child. You know, so luckily there was there was a sport for that called running. Um, did pretty well in high school, I, you know, running, but I was hurt a lot. Went on to University of Virginia and ran track and cross country there. You know, like all college athletes was hurt all the time. Could probably hardly string together two months of training without being hurt. Um, went to medical school, mostly from my interest in running injuries. You know, in college, I was like a guinea pig of of uh, Dr. Daniel Cooland, who was this kind of mad scientist of running injuries. And, you know, I got fascinated by what he did. And I'm like, that would be kind of cool to do as a career. So that got me interested in science and medical school, went to medical school, you know, and through that process, you know, I got in, I, I really enjoyed trying things to kind of make people well. I thought I, I was going to be an orthopedic surgeon because that's all I knew was all the, the injury stuff. But I, I found I found my way into family medicine, which is, you know, general practice for the international audience and flight medicine. If you're in the military, that's trying to keep populations well and healthy, you know, it involves nutrition, physical activity. But back then, I really didn't know much about that other than what we were told, you know, so we were all told back in the 1980s, you know, well, a healthy diet, of course, is a, a low fat diet, you know, with food pyramid, carbohydrates, never eat an egg. Um, you know, all, all that stuff that we grew up with. And uh, I developed prediabetes about six, seven years ago, and it made me rethink everything. But probably my first foray into realizing that, you know, half, probably at least half of what we've learned in medical school is wrong. We just don't know what half is right. So we're trying to find the truth. And I didn't make that up. I think it was Dina Harvard Medical School said that at a commencement maybe 20 years ago. But you know, I had some pretty bad structural injuries on my feet uh, about the year 2000, 1999, 2000, was running competitively and had really bad arthritis changes in my large toes, which are really important for running. So I had, you know, kind of a classic bunion, you know, my toes were bent in, my, my feet looked like a track spike. And if you look at, you know, kind of a modern track spike, you know, it's pointed at the toes, it's very narrow, it squeezes your feet, spent a lot of time in that type of a shoe. And my feet took the damage. I, all those bones in my big toe were kind of fused. It didn't bend. And that affected my whole gait. You know, my foot wouldn't act as a shock absorber. I didn't understand that much. 
but they straightened my toe out a little bit with surgery, took out some of the bone, but was told at that time, you know, you probably shouldn't run anymore, you know, find a different sport. You know, I write about this in the book, but there's something magic about if you're a runner and if any of your audience out there are runners and just love it. And if I told you tomorrow that, okay, you just can't run anymore, period, that's, it's done. I don't think anyone would accept that. You know, that would be a, like not quite a significant loss as like a family member. But if you think of the losses in your life that are like, whoa, that, I, that's unacceptable, you know, loss of spouse, your kids, you know, those, but if you're a runner and I say you can't run, that's like, well, I'm not going to accept that. I'm going to figure it out. So a few months after that surgery, I actually started to study running because I knew that I knew nothing about running really other than all the mistakes I'd made. I started to study biomechanics, uh, footwear, understand the value of running slow. So, you know, any competitive athlete out there really doesn't know what slow is. You know, we just kind of go out every day and we work hard. That's the culture. So I, I embraced the slow and I recovered and I, I ended up, you know, running really well again, you know, with way less effort. And year 2000 was my last running injury, which was the surgery. And, you know, now I, I think the only way I would get hurt running is if, you know, I, I stepped into something, you know, or you had a traumatic injury. It wouldn't be like an overuse injury. You know, I think I've got enough headroom or margin of injury. You know, you try to develop yourself to be kind of bulletproof and running. And yeah, so it's been, a, it's, the, I explain it in the books, all the different ways that you can get to that point, you know, but running should prevent us from getting hurt. It shouldn't cause us to get hurt. You know, I, I run around a lot now and I run every day so I can go do things, you know, with my kids that, you know, say I want to ski or play soccer or play pickup basketball, you know, I shouldn't get hurt doing those things. You know, so if I run every day and do strength mobility work, then I can be a normal human even into my 50s and not end up with these injuries. But that's that's a little of the background. And, you know, I'm trying to teach this to my community. So I'm involved in a number of projects, grants in the community. You know, I own a small running store. You know, we have a large race in eight days that I co-direct. You know, so you're kind of all in on all these projects because change really happens from the bottom up, meaning you got to get people out trying these things. You could give lectures to students. That doesn't go very far, but you got to get out there and live it and teach it to your community. Invest in that. Absolutely. And I love that you started off by talking about movement in children because you also have children and I know just watching them that they are experts at just moving naturally and they'll run, they'll sprint, they'll stop, they'll climb, they'll squat. That's play for them. And they're doing essentially a really intensive workout every single day when I watch them outside the window while I'm here recording podcast. And I'm so curious if you have any um, guidelines that you would recommend to parents. I love that you mentioned, you know, not creating children who are specializing too early on. And I know based on the statistics, we're seeing young athletes having, for instance, elbow injuries from pitching too much too soon or rotator cuff injuries or things that previously never existed for kids. And I joke with my friends as I have some friends who put their kids in dozens of activities and it's all about taking them to structured things. And I joke kind of like that meme on Facebook, like, Hey, I put my kids in an activity. It's called go outside and play. It meets every day. Um, and they just get so much movement through that. But I'm curious if you have any more elaborate guidelines you can give for parents with kids who obviously have an interest in movement and in sports, and that's wonderful, but making sure that we're also protecting their bodies and their joints and their health long-term as well. Yeah. You hit the nail on the head there, Katie. Play is the process fitness is uh, yeah they play fitness is is what you might gain from that so play is by definition is no outcome right it's it's purposeless it's just you go out and, and you do it you're in the moment and that's really where it should all start and that goes into adulthood too you, you, i mean why why do adults continue most people will start an exercise program because they're maybe they they're trying to lose some weight or their doctor said they need to do it. But the ones who persist in it find something that really doesn't have an outcome, right? They, they, they just get something from it that's not on their Strava feed or something or their Fitbit. That stuff might motivate you a little in the beginning, but it's not going to keep people doing it day after day. They, they have to want to do it. Like I get to go out, not I have to go out. You know, gosh, it's a beautiful day today. You know, I get to go out and move today. Unfortunately, children these days, you know, they've become kind of zoo humans, you know, and under house arrest, you know, a little bit of its culture, some of its built environment, you know, you live in a beach area. So 
my first running was actually on the beach barefoot was where I did my first, what you would call like running to run and cover distances. I hopped into some runs with my older brother who was on the cross country team and we'd go to the beach, you know, for a couple of weeks in the summer and he would be doing his running and I would just hop in with him. And, you know, I, I think I was like 11 and I, on the beach, this was like my second or third run, you know, a directed run because we, we played tag all the time and all that stuff. But we, we ran 12 miles barefoot on the beach just like that. And probably today, just the way kids live, it'd be hard to find a kid that you could just pull out of the playground at age 11, you know, with bare feet on the Jersey shore and say, okay, run to the end of the island at six miles, turn around and run back. You know, we didn't have power bars. We just, I don't even think we stopped for water or anything, but that wasn't weird. It wasn't like dangerous behavior. That was normal when we didn't get overuse injuries, but that was, you know, it's like Kenyan kids, right? They run to school, to and from school just to get there, really. That's the only purpose. They're not training to win marathons. They just want to get to school. But then when you line them up in a race one day, they've got this massive aerobic development. They've developed the natural movement patterns because they've done it bare feet. And that translates into any sport. You know, kids don't develop good movement patterns. It's really tragic now. There's an epidemic of non-contact ACL tears, which is the anterior cruciate ligament, mostly of females because of their landing patterns and slightly wider hips. So they'll tear their ACL, you know, pre-puberty, which is really scary. That injury at that age, there's all this controversy, you know, do you fix it surgically? They're still growing. Do you wait till, you know, after puberty? And maybe they've developed arthritis. Europeans view the problem different, but we should not have those kind of injuries. And uh, I don't know what the true root cause is, but when the incidence is going up of these kind of injuries, we need to look at multiple mechanisms of what it is that's that's driving that but if you're a parent out there and you got to get out there with them I'm, I'm sorry like you can't just sit and answer emails and tell you open the door and tell your kids to go out so you, you got to get out there the the most important influencer on whether a child will be physically active is what would you guess it is is it a school policy is it the latest media campaign is it a fitbit what what would you guess it is if you have kids, what is the most powerful driver of whether your kid will go outside and play? I would guess it's like any aspect of raising kids. It's if they see you do it, not even yeah, just say you do it. Same you. with, I know in nutrition, it's if they see you eat it. You, parent, right? It's, it's, it's you. So when they're young, it's you. Unfortunately, teenagers, the biggest influence on their behavior is their five closest friends. So ultimately, you know, I've got a 13-year-old daughter now and a 15-year-old son. So for better or worse, just the way it is, my influence on them is still there, but they're starting to be influenced more by their peer group. So, you know, try to, if they're hanging in a wrong crowd, maybe that's where, you know, maybe you do have to use a little parental wisdom and try to redirect them. But when they're five, you know, you go outside, bring the dog and just go to the playground. That's powerful. Climb the you know, the little monkey gym with them. <laughs> and that's why you don't want to be sick yourself. You know, geez, you want to be able to do that stuff with your kids. For sure. And to echo what you just said, I love so much that the small shift of saying, instead of I have to, I get to, I think that's a valuable tip in any aspect of life. Uh, I've heard that recommended by people. That's the only thing you change in just your mindset. It's amazing how you'll see that play out in your life. Just because we tend to resist things we have to do and we tend to look forward to things we get to do. And so I think that subtle shift can make such a huge difference for so many people. And I echo your concerns about all these injuries, like I said, that we're seeing in young children and especially pre-puberty. I know the latest data I saw was that people, especially girls who have ACL tears pre-puberty have a very, very high instance of arthritis early in life, like in their 30s or younger, which is drastic. We've never seen this before with kids. And I think you're right. There's a lot of components that come into play here. And certainly I look at it from the nutrition side as my background, but I think there's also movement patterns, both in kids not moving enough. Like you mentioned how much you were able to run 12 miles in one day as a kid. And my kids, I think would actually be able to do that, but that's because they're running every single day, 10 plus miles in our neighborhood, just, and they call it play. And we have standing caption flag games and tag games, and they play a game called infection. And to them, it's fun, but they're also exercising much, much more than most of us do. And, but I think another thing, another issue that really comes into play there is 
potentially like the way that they are running and the, the way their feet are being formed, especially in kids whose feet are still growing. And I know that you are an expert in this and I'd love to hear your take on what kind of footwear, if any, our kids should be wearing, especially young, because their feet are developing. And from what I've researched, at least what's on their foot can actually impact how their foot develops. Is that correct? Or what's your take on that? Oh, yeah, definitely, Katie. So what you what you put on a child's feet is not like putting a sweater on, like some piece of clothing. But just to give your audience a couple really quick references, if you're interested in this concept of play, there's a wonderful book by Stuart Brown, just called Play, which just not that you want to sit inside and read this book, but it, you put it on your audio book, but it, it describes all of the brain chemistry of play, um, going back to ancestry. And another book was actually written by a former NBA a player. His name is Bob Bigelow, and it was called Just Let the Kids Play. Amazing book, but it, it just outlines what's wrong with the culture today of these single sport, you know, kids are driven into, you know, thinking they need to be, you know, performing for college scholarships, you know, in, in the third grade. It's just so distorted. But you read that book, and if you're a parent who's kind of going down that path, maybe you know, your kids in the prep school, you know, in fourth grade, and all the parents are like already talking to college recruiters, it'll make you pause <laughs> and say, okay, am I crazy? Or are they crazy? And you're right, they're crazy. So that is a powerful, powerful book, I, I would recommend everyone read it. If a kid, like if you're a coach, maybe some of the parents out there are coaches, your only job is if the kid wants to come back to practice tomorrow, you are a good coach. That is the most important thing. If they want to come back, you're doing a kick-ass job. Technical stuff, you know, teach them movement, but if they, if the environment is they want to come back to practice, that's amazing. So the feet, so the feet have 26 bones, 36 different joints in uh, the foot and ankle, 100 muscle tendon attachments, four layers of muscles. So the feet do things that I think no one really fully understands. And it's kind of like magic because the feet are the spring of the body. So running is a mass spring mechanism, meaning we use elasticity. We don't use power and levers. If you watch a kid run, it's very springy. You know, if you watch them on the playground doing jump rope or hopscotch, it's very springy. So the foot is really the, the foundation of all that spring. So the foot, ha the foot's like the lunar lander in shape. You know, it's like a tripod and that that has to be functioning well, and that will decrease the impacts up the kinetic chain. So that can be decommissioned very early in life. So if we take a toddler, you know, say a two-year-old, and we put them in a really stiff structured shoe with an arch support, and you're kind of decommissioning all of that musculature, musculature tendons, fascia, which is all the connective tissue, you know, what's happening over time is you're, you're detuning the spring, you, you meaning you're it's dampening. You know, if you have a spring that's functioning well and you brace it, it's dampening. And then you get hurt and they tell you use an orthotic, it's dampening more. Then they, then they say you need, you know, some other foot shoe device, you know, that's stiffer and harder and more supportive. They're dampening it more. So you don't want to keep dampening the spring, especially from a young age. I, I wrote a textbook chapter on this, which we can share the link. It's on, it's linked from my book's website, runforyourlifebook.com. But actually, the study, which was a seminal study, was one done in 1908 by a gentleman named Hoffman. And he showed, like, back in those days, they actually used x-rays in shoe stores, you know, before we were worried about radiation and stuff. So that's how you would fit a shoe. You'd come in and you'd get a, a, a flora, fluoroscopy, you'd get an x-ray. So he showed within four weeks of a sensible shoe, you started to change the direction of the child's first toe, the great toe. And when that great toe is bent in, you can imagine what that does to the foundation of the foot. So think of a stool with three legs and you chopped one of them off or shortened one of them. Now, now you don't have this nice stable base. And that's what happened to me. My big toe was, was bent in, you know, 30 to 40 degrees. So when my foot hit the ground, it didn't have any spring left. So, you know, my knees, my hips, IT band, plantar fascia, all these different structures back took the load because my feet couldn't deal with that. So I had to create more power too, because I lost, you know, when you actually run efficiently, you know, you're about 50% efficient in energy return, like a Super Bowl, right? A, a tuned Super Bowl, you drop it to the ground, it doesn't come all the way back up, but it comes, you know, maybe halfway back up. But if you drop a hacky sack to the ground, you know, it's just like, thud, right? That's not good. So, and you see it, you like, you, you watch a kid jump rope, and they're in this nice rhythm, all of them are in the same rhythm. 
but adults you won't see in that rhythm because they've decommissioned their feet. So if you're a parent out there, yeah, let your kid just run around barefoot. That's the safest thing. Um, and if they do need shoes, get them one that you could roll up and put in your pocket, you know, just something to protect them. You know, say it's winter time or, you know, yeah, they got to go to school and the teachers are going to throw them out if they don't have a shoe. So you have something that covers their feet is acceptable socially, you know, whatever your circles are or activity. And if they need a sports specific shoe, you know, get the widest and most flexible you can, you know, so most cleats are really dysfunctional for kids. Like if you look at them, you know, 40 pound kid playing peewee soccer and, and you can't even bend the cleat, like try to bend these cleats. They're so stiff. And imagine that child who only weighs 40 pounds trying to bend that, you know, while they're running and they can't run well. You see them try to run around in these shoes and they have difficulty. So it's all like really simple, simple, simple. I mean, just a shoe is let the foot do what it's supposed to do. And the shoe is really just an ornamental covering to allow the foot to develop. And you, know, you only get one chance to develop your foot. So if you've decommissioned it early or early in life, caused structural problems just by the shape of the shoe, postural problems because you've elevated the heel and now the child's adjusted their back and their hips, it's going to be hard to reverse that because their movement patterns are going to get mapped in very early in life. And to kind of rewire that takes, you know, however many thousand repetitions you want to believe, you know, to re rewire movement pattern. So you'd rather not mess it up to begin with. For sure. And I wonder if this is partially why we're also seeing more, I know we see like more knee and foot type injuries now with women. Do you think there's a connection between wearing heels a lot? I mean, if a raised heel and a kid can make a big difference, does the same oh, apply to adults yeah. wearing heels? Yeah. So if you're a female out there or a male, but for females, it tends to be a little more extreme because their heels will be up at two or three inches and their feet are only, you know, size seven females foot is about half the length of a size 13 or 14 male, you know, so the slope, meaning the rise over run, you know, so if you put a two to three inch heel on a foot, that's maybe, you know, six inches long, you know, they're walking around all day on a 30% grade. I'm not making that up. I mean, you're, you're, and then the, the pressure is actually on that first toe joint because it tends to be flat where the toe is, you know, so you're, at this bend at the, at the meta, we call it the metatarsal phalangeal joint, but that's kind of where your toes meet the midfoot. And then the toe is actually squeezed in too, right? So your foot's going to be shaped like a shoe. Ultimately, over time, your Achilles tendon shortens, your calf muscles, gastroc soleus shorten, plantar fascia shorten. So all of these tissues start to shorten. And then if you try to kind of transition out of that and get to a more flat shoe, you're probably going to have some discomfort because all these tissues that are now shortened are trying to get back out to length. So it's a process. If you've been in super high heels, you know, for 10, 20 years, you're not going to be able to just chuck them away and start walking naturally in a week. But what that also does, it really changes your pattern of movement from one of uh, glute or posterior chain dominant to quad dominant. So when our heels are up we're, and you watch how people run and move, they're mostly going to use their quads. And when they land, if their foot has that deformed big toe, meaning that foot collapses in because the big toe is not in the game, what happens is that drives the knee in. So it's, we call it knee valgus. It's like so valgus with an L. So when they land, if you see pictures of people landing, you know, their knee is caving in. So their leg is kind of shaped kind of like an L with the point of the L kind of pointing toward the middle. And that movement will contribute to the ACL injury. So when you jump and land like that and you get this torsion force through the knee joint in a dysfunctional way, snap, you know, that ACL goes. Now a proper landing pattern and, you know, the high end soccer teams, basketball teams, you know, they'll be trained doing jump training really early in the season, you know, to kind of land like a cat. So land squat back, no knees caving in. So they're going to practice and practice and practice this landing pattern. But what happens is, unless that's your ingrained pattern, when you're under fatigue, things tend to just go back to default. So it's the fourth uh, period of a basketball game, and you're under fatigue, and you don't have a good movement pattern wired in your brain, and you just take one bad landing that you shouldn't have done, and boom, it happens, and it's catastrophic, and it ends careers. And it could also change someone, not just their athletic career, but, you know, they don't have the vigorous life anymore. So if you had a 
catastrophic knee injury. Now you got knee arthritis. Ah, <laughs> you know, there goes, you know, jogging with your dog. And that's, that's too bad. But it all starts with the kids, just like nutrition, right? You know, if a, if a child's obese at age five, their odds of being an adult obese is like 80 to 90%. So you need to get on this early in life or else you're committing that poor child to a difficult battle, not an unwinnable one, but one that's much more difficult. Yeah. And when you talk about heels, I think of, um, cause I very rarely wear heels, but um, last year I did a really big hike uh, in the Alps and we were up an Alp and down an Alp and walking down was actually tougher than up. And the next day my toes were so sore. My big toes were so sore and my foot, because I'm not used to moving that way. And it made me think this grade that my feet are at walking down this hill, that's kind of the grade that some people are using every yeah. day if they're wearing heels. And it was really uncomfortable for a few days. And because it was different for me, I really, really felt it. Yeah, you you know, all it takes is going on some country road and you see caution 6% grade, 10% grade. And that's a big steep hill. And you're walking on like twice that. But all all I suggest to people, Katie, to do is do like a two-week test. Not while they're running, because running is a little too high a force if you're transitioning. But walk for two weeks in a flatter shoe or a flat shoe and then go try to put those heels back on and see kind of how your hips and your back feel. And usually people are like, wow, <laughs> I can't, you know, all those shoes are like at the goodwill because they can't wear those shoes anymore. Um, so do your own experiment on that, you know, try to go like a two week flat test just, and ladies actually are, are pretty fortunate. So they, True flats for ladies are actually acceptable. People tend to go to either extreme. They'll wear flats or they'll wear heels. And I, I think that in the corporate world, the ladies who are on the shorter side tend to wear the heels culturally. But I think there was a really good article in the Washington Post. We have it posted up in my store. It was an editorial empowering women basically to you know say F you to the world that is giving them some kind of bias if they're not in these horrible shoes. It was just empowering women to say, okay, my foot health matters. I'm wearing flats. And if that bothers you, you know, go to hell, you know, I mean, in respectful terms, but you you can't put your body through pain thinking you're trying to please someone else. And I think culturally we've gotten over that, you know, 20 years ago, probably we didn't even have females in corporate boardrooms and now females can walk into corporate boardrooms in flat shoes. So I think we're, it's the revolution. So yeah, it's okay. You have a, I think you have a whole tribe behind you saying it's okay. You don't have to wreck your body to, to please anyone. Absolutely. That was my experience. Once I switched to more comfortable minimalist type shoes, I donated all my heels. I think I have one pair that's like occasionally I'll wear it to a wedding or a black tie event, but they're just not comfortable and it's not worth it anymore. Um, and I want to, before, I don't want to spend all of our time on barefoot shoes, even though I think this is a super important topic because you also have expertise in another area. And I love that you are a doctor who now has a focus on nutrition because I feel like this is a rare thing and it's super important. So I'd love to know, you mentioned that you were pre-diabetic a while back. So back, I'm really curious what you've learned about nutrition in your research and how you combine that with medicine. Yeah, and it's almost kind of humorous to think that, wow, this, here's a doctor who cares about nutrition. <laughs> you know, you're like, wait, shouldn't that be, you know, 80% of illness now is chronic disease, you know, not acute trauma. So, and what we put in our mouths affects any chronic disease, um, not necessarily causative for all of it, but certainly it affects it. So this should be foundational to everything any health professional is learning. So. Yeah, I mean, we all learned when I was in school, well, of course, you know, eating fat made you fat. A calorie is a calorie. Calories in, calories out is how you gained or lost weight. Um, We needed to eat a low-fat diet, the food pyramid, and, you know, don't even eat an egg or bacon or anything. You know, it's all because it has cholesterol, and cholesterol is going to clog your arteries. You know, that was called the diet heart hypothesis, and that wasn't really based in any science. That was a political meeting, you know, in the Senate and the McGovern Commission and the USDA trying to create the first dietary guidelines for America, which was based on this fear of heart disease. So we had to do something, right? And that was kind of the reaction, like, let's just do something, even if it was wrong. But that's what we learned in medical school. So we were probably worse than knowing nothing. So what we learned and taught and just propagated, you know, 
out there to society was stuff. And if you look at the curve, you know, it's pretty clear. So when we started this way of thinking in 1980, that was the first time we ignored what our grandparents did. And they didn't have much chronic disease and followed the government advice. And we actually followed that advice. So since 1980, you know, Americans eat less, less fat, more carbohydrates, protein's been pretty neutral. But what's happened to that obesity curve and diabetes curve since 1980? Yeah, it's gone through the, through the yeah, roof, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's like a hockey surprise, yeah. Yeah, yeah, my state is number one. So we have just uh, two weeks ago, the new CDC data came out. Um, my state has 38% obesity. That's uh, overweight is well over 60% obesity. In 1980, that was less than 15%. So, whoa, that's like two generations. Diabetes is like 17%. Prediabetes is over, same, prediabetes is the same thing. It's over 50%. So, wait a minute, <laughs> you know, we're following this advice and things are going wrong. But that's what we thought. And it took me getting, you know, getting ill to understand it. And, that, and I think I came because of my foot experience, you know. So, when I got this problem in my military physical, you know, my labs were all off off the whack and I was waking up every morning at two in the morning because I needed more cereal I was like eight times a day cereal with skim milk because I was what's called insulin resistant high insulin levels so my body couldn't use any fat as fuel so I couldn't make it more than four hours without adding more carbohydrate to my body so I was waking up not because I wanted to every morning at two in the morning because my body physiologically had to but I didn't understand it. I, I was just thinking, well, maybe it's because I run and I just need the calories. But then I got this lab work back and I was fortunate just to, at that time I was working on this project called the Efficient Running uh, Project for the Air Force. And so the charge for that project, Katie, was to help people pass the fitness test. There were new standards and failure rates were going up, injury rates were going up. And I was looked on in the Air Force as kind of like the running guy, you know, and it was people thought it was a running problem because that's where they were failing the test. But um, I looked at the data in that kind of subset of people failing. And I noticed that if they had a high BMI, their odds of failing the test were like super high. So I needed to sort out the BMI issue, you know, so if we weren't addressing the BMI, didn't matter what kind of running training they were doing, they were probably still in difficulty. And I came across the first article that made me challenge what I thought to be true you know, you just kind of ran, this was before even Google, I think, you know, so, but there were some search engines, I think Internet Explorer, so I'm searching things. And I came across this article by Gary Taubes. It was called, Maybe It's All Been a Big Fat Lie. It was a New York Times magazine cover article from like 2002, which challenged the conventional wisdom. And he had followed that art. So I read that article. And I'm like, that's fascinating, because it's actually what I witness every day in my medical practice, you know, the no one that I'm seeing as a doctor is actually losing weight. You know, they're all gaining weight, you know, with this advice. And I picked up his book, Good Calories, Bad Calories, which was like this 450 page tome with 1200 references, this historical tome about nutritional science. And I read it like three times and I was like, wow, that just makes sense, right? It's, it's what it is. And that was my last bowl of cereal. But then I spent about four months on the road traveling to Air Force bases and giving these seminars on how to pass the fitness test. And I was curious about, about the diet and what people were doing in the real world. So I'd go to these bases and there'd be 50 to 100 people. We would do these workshops, you know, teach them running mechanics, a little barefoot running, you know, slow down their training, all the principles that I talk about in the book. But I would ask this question, has anyone in the audience lost 50 pounds and kept it off for a year? You know, just and a couple would raise their hand, maybe one, maybe two. And I'd ask those folks, you know, well, what have you done across the board, no matter where I was? Well, I got rid of sugar. Well, I, I'm doing Atkins, or they'd say the word, or, you know, I got rid of bread, or I'm doing paleo. You know, paleo was hardly even a word then, but it, there was a small kind of cult of, of paleo, but it was all kind of a similar thing. They all got rid of the sugar. And that, you know, that was my kind of Air Force validation of maybe this is true because I didn't have a single person through those four months and probably, I don't know, 50 to 100 military bases say, well, I, I'm doing Ornish, or I'm doing the low fat diet. And it, so it was kind of, and then it came back to my medical hospital and presented this stuff at a staff meeting that, okay, maybe we should just not serve all the diabetics, all the sugar, let's just see how it goes. And, and that met some resistance, but they allowed me to do it. And we, you know, we started in my hospital 
teaching people, well, let's just, you're in the hospital, you're in a controlled setting, let's not feed you sugar and not give you all that insulin that you take every day and let's just see what happens. You know, what do what you got to lose, right? And you'd see people just coming down on these insulin doses and they stayed off it, you know, they, they lose the weight. You know, and, and then books started to come out after that. You know, you had New Atkins for a New You, Finney Volek, um, the scientists in the field, you know, 800 papers between them, Eric Westman. And now, like, the world has exploded in this low-carb world. And the science, is, it has, the science has always been there, but the conventional wisdom has always been the opposite. So now we're trying to move the science back into the medical training at my school to say, okay, this is a path that everyone should be offered. If you're obese or diabetic, you know, we just need to give people information and let them decide, you know, one option, which is probably the preferred option, because all these people have what's called hyperinsulinemia, you know, their insulin levels are high, because they're insulin resistant, and insulin is the miracle grow for fat. And the main driver of insulin is carbohydrates. So if you have a big belly, that's where insulin stores carbohydrates as fat. Let's just give you this option. How about three weeks, you get rid of the sugar? just give it a go. And we have to deal with their brain because it's a powerful chemical addiction. Robert Lustig has written that, you know, the dopamine effect of sugar, sugar is highly addictive. So unless we, but that's give them that option. Now they could say, no, it's not, I don't, you know, I love my bread too much, but at least they, they need to know. And we owe it to them as healthcare professionals to at least say, look, this option exists. It's, it's the preferred option. If you have this problem, diabetes, obesity, that's where the data says they should start there and give it a go and we need to support them and not tell them that that egg is going to cause a heart attack because that's not true you know the opposite is true the the diabetes is going to drive that but that's it in a nutshell is so yes do some reading on that you know so low carbohydrate diets if you have obesity and diabetes should be the first place to start and that's real food you know it's not buying you know atkins bars or processed low carb junk food you know there's a whole market for that now or you know, eating pork rinds every day, that's not good. You know, eat a good serving of vegetables at every meal, non-starchy. Don't be afraid of good quality meats, cheese, butter, right? The real stuff, um, eggs on the table. You know, this stuff is how you roll. And that's been my diet for six, seven years. And I've had every test of everything to look for disease in my body. <laughs> and, and I don't have any. So, you know, for me, it's working because my genetics will drive me to, my father had a heart attack at 35. So my, my genes will drive me the wrong way if I live the way the standard American does now. But there's more than one road to Rome, but that option should be the one front and center, at least for my state where the majority have this problem, not the minority. I think it's interesting to note also that when you were originally diagnosed with prediabetes, you were doing a lot of the things that the traditional advice would be that would keep you from having health problems. You were, I'm sure, getting plenty of exercise. You were eating low fat. You were doing the things that were commonly recommended. So based on the conventional wisdom, you should have been the picture of health, right? Yeah. I w and there's a concept of fit, but not healthy. So yeah, I was fit. I could run faster then than I can now. You know, so I mean, I'm about ready to turn 52. So I mean, my marathon times slow down. Just, you know, your strength gets a little less as you get older aerobic capacity drops. So I was like super fit then. But if you looked at my health markers, I was not. You know, I had high triglycerides, uh, low HDL, hemoglobin A1C was above the ideal range in the pre-diabetic range. So those things are not, and you see that a lot with over-exercisers, right? You know, so, you know, people that are exercising too much, you know, can drive themselves into all kinds of problems, including cardiac problems. So, we need, just need to separate the two. So my focus is to get healthy. And I think if you stay healthy through age, then you can do all your sport. If, if for some reason you lose your health, then you can't do the things you love to do. So my focus now is to stay healthy and line up in races every now and then. And if I'm healthy, I can still race pretty well because I'm healthy. If I wasn't healthy, I wouldn't even get to the starting line. For sure. And I think I go back to a lot, um, the idea that you can't out exercise a poor diet. You can't out supplement a poor diet. You also can't out exercise or out supplement poor sleep. I think those are two yeah, is, really underestimated and important factors. Yeah, that's called like sleep doping. You know, if you look at athletic performance, but there actually what you mentioned there is actually a great article you could link. It's it's by uh, 
Timothy Noakes, Dr. Timothy Noakes, uh, and Stephen Finney. It's called You Can't Outrun a Bad Diet. I think Asim Mohatra contributed to that from the UK. But it talks about that whole thing. And anything that Timothy Noakes has, Dr. Timothy Noakes from South Africa, he just wrote this amazing book called The Lore of Nutrition. And I think that is like the new Bible outside of Gary Taub's 2008 Good Calories, Bad Calories. So those are some good reads. Yeah, I've read both of those and they're, they're really good. And I think another point that you hit on that's so important to note is that it's especially that combination that like fats in and of themselves are not bad and either it's protein, either are vegetables, but there is that unique thing that happens when you are combining too many carbohydrates with all of these things, especially in a processed sense. And I'm sure like, like I have, you've looked at the data and it's really unheard of in history to see this rapid of an increase in things like obesity and heart disease and cancer and just this meteoric rise that we're having across the board is completely unheard of throughout history. And granted, we have many factors that our bodies are dealing with now that even our grandparents didn't have to deal with. But um, we have seen this drastic change in the dietary recommendations in the last couple of generations. And now we're seeing the effects of that this podcast is brought to you by Steady MD, and I have a story to tell you about them. I love this concierge medicine company because they have an amazing team of doctors and they match you with one who shares your values and your health ideals. This way, your doctor knows your full medical history and is available anytime you need him or her for calls, video chat, or text questions, which is what I usually use. With their new family plan, you can ask questions about your kids, and this is where the story comes in. Last year, I could only just now finally talk about this because it was so traumatic, there was an outbreak of empatigo in our neighborhood, possibly from a water slide that all of the kids in the neighborhood played on. And if you don't know, empatigo is a type of staph infection on the skin, and it was bad. There were 30 kids with skin infections all at once. It was pitiful to witness, and they kept transferring it back and forth because it's highly contagious and can live on surfaces for weeks or months. So all of us were doing an extreme amount of laundry and cleaning and trying to stay on top of it. And all of my neighbors were having to take their kids to urgent care or to local doctors, and they were getting all kinds of opinions on the best type of treatment, ranging from multiple courses of oral antibiotics to use of topical antibiotic creams or both. Since I have not found a good doctor where we moved to yet, I was so grateful to have my steady MD doctor literally in my pocket on my phone. So while everyone else was sitting in doctor's offices for multiple hours and multiple visits to see a doctor, I was able to video chat with mine, share pictures of my kids, and get his advice instantly. He already knew my preference is to avoid oral antibiotics whenever possible, and he worked with me on a plan to tackle the impetigo naturally and to only use topical treatments and save oral antibiotics as a last ditch effort, which we did not have to use, thank goodness. He was really great at combining conventional methods using a little bit of topical ointment with natural methods and different baths that we used. He was on call for the several weeks of the healing process to make sure there were no complications. He checked in every day and he gave me peace of mind during a really stressful time. I've used them so many other times for little things that require peace of mind or even for bigger, does this need stitches or do we need to go to the ER type questions. I cannot recommend them highly enough and you should check them out at steadymd.com forward slash wellness mama to learn more. Again, that's steady, S T E A D Y M D.com forward slash wellness mama. This episode is brought to you by Kettle and Fire Bone Broth and Soups. I have used these products for years and I always keep my pantry well stocked. They have chicken bone broth, beef bone broth, and a new chicken mushroom bone broth, which is delicious. Those are all great as a base for soups or even just sipped on their own. But Kettle and Fire also now has tomato, butternut, and miso soups, which are often incorporated as part of a meal in our house. Their newest products are a grass-fed chili and a Thai chicken soup. These are great meals all on their own, and they make last-minute dinners so easy at my house. Their broths are made from grass-fed and pastured animal bones, and they're a great source of collagen and amino acids like proline and glycine. I incorporate collagen in some form every day, and Kettle and Fire makes it super tasty to do this. You can learn more. Go to kettleandfire.com forward slash wellnessmama and use the code wellnessmama20 to save 20% on your order. So again, kettleandfire.com 
all spelled out K-E-T-T-L-E-A-N-D-F-I-R-E.com forward slash wellness mama and make sure to use the code wellness mama 20 to save 20%. So I'm, I'm really grateful that you are on the front lines in a state that's really suffering from this problem, trying to make changes. And if my research for this episode is correct, you actually were instrumental in getting a hospital's food policies changed. Is that right? Yeah. So the, I think what everyone can agree on, Katie, so you have the camp, you know, that thinks that all meat's going to kill you. And then you have the carnivore camp who are, so you, you have all these people kind of fighting each other, but the biggest elephant in the room is the sugar drinks would be the simplest one to remove. And then the processed junk food carbohydrates. And I think whether you're a vegetarian or a carnivore, everyone would agree that that's where we meet in the middle that we need to go after. So we got rid of all the sugar drinks in my hospital uh, for patients in the cafeteria, you know, in all the vending machines. So there are no sugar drinks in my hospital. And I'm, I'm proud of that, but it's a small, I mean, that should be, duh, right? That should be self-evident. I mean, we got rid of tobacco 15 years ago in hospitals, you know, 30 years after we knew that it was harmful. We finally got it out of hospitals. So that if we're waiting for the healthcare industry to fix all this, you know, for the healthcare industry, and I work in it, it is what it is, you know, a lifetime of treatment is, is better than a cure. So we need to kind of take the bull by its horn, so to speak, but we need to go out there and just make change. Um, and it's got to start somewhere, you know, so we're working through schools now to try to get rid of, I mean, they'll consider chocolate milk health food in schools now, which is really sad. You know, there's as much sugar in chocolate milk as a soda juice, you know, so juice is not health food you know, to these poor kids with obesity, they start drinking juice that they might as well have the soda. It's the same thing. So we're trying to get people to understand where all the sugar is. And, um, and it's about the why too. It's not like we went in there and we banned stuff and, you know, crammed this down people's throats, like this is some new policy. So we involved all layers of the hospital, including, you know, the kitchen staff, administrators, nursing, okay, what can we do together and how are we going to promote this message? And it's about the why, like, why are we doing this? We know this is a problem. And if we can't, as a healthcare institution, at least take a small step in trying to set an example, how can we expect the schools to get rid of sugar drinks if the hospital isn't willing to do it? You know, if 80% of the hospital admissions now, which is, which is true, are due to metabolic disease, and if sugar is a big driver of metabolic disease, and we're feeding those people that stuff while they're in the hospital, I mean, that's, I mean, it really is. It's insane. It's complete insanity, but it happens all the time. And that kind of woke my eyes up, you know, when, you know, I had a patient, you know, that it's like four years ago, you know, we're talking about all this stuff. And, and then I come back a little later in the day and there's a soda on the tray and the, and the patient's like, well, if this stuff is really bad, why in the hell are you feeding it to me in the hospital? You know, if that's why I'm here. And it's like, damn, you're right. Because, I mean, we, yeah, at that point it was hard to block it, right? They would just hit the button, ask the nurse for a soda, and it would show up in two minutes, you know? Because our, our goal in hospitals is customer satisfaction. I mean, that really is how hospitals are great. And that can make everyone very happy by baking them all chocolate chip cookies and bringing them soda. But that has nothing to do with, them getting healthier again. So our job isn't to make everyone uber happy. Our job is to give them some knowledge so they can get healthy again and they can choose to, to take that or, or leave it, but we have to offer it to them. Yeah. It's amazing to me that understanding what we now know about the microbiome and the insul insulin response and the way the body responds to certain foods that so many places we are still feeding people post-surgery or in chemotherapy or who just had a heart yeah. attack, we're still feeding them yeah soda and processed soda. foods for every meal yeah, yeah. and if it's a, if it's low fat right then it's, it's like the heart of, the diabetics are at huge risk of heart attack you know so diabetes is heart disease it's the same thing at a cellular level and if they go into the hospital and they're given a low fat diet for their heart disease which includes tons of bread and sugar and we think we're giving them a heart healthy diet we're, we're no kidding we are wrong we're absolutely wrong we're doing the wrong thing for these patients we have to flip that food pyramid on its head for that group, you know, that has the obesity and the diabetes. Different than the smokers, you know, so we know smoking is a huge driver of heart disease. So we all know they get rid of the smoke, but now it's the diabetes is the main driver of the heart disease because everyone is aware and policies are in place. You know, so my 13 year old can't go into 7-Eleven and buy cigarettes. I mean, when I was in fifth grade, I could. 
you know, so we have policies in place and they cost like eight bucks a pack now. So the affordability, accessibility and acceptability of tobacco, you know, so you can't smoke on hospital grounds anymore. In many public places you can't smoke, but sugar has all three, you know, right on the money, right? It's affordable. The cheapest thing you can buy is sugar stuff. It's acceptable. Every birthday party, every school lunch, you know, hospital menus, and it's uh, ex accessible everywhere, right? You get it anywhere you want is, is sugar. So unless we go at it from a policy level and affect those things, you know, it's too affordable, accessible and acceptable. You know, we have to kind of work from that level and, and turn it around. But that's, that's a tougher battle because then you're looking at what, you know, you're invading people's rights. They'll say, well, no, you can't go to someone and say they can't have this even if it's killing them because it's America, but we need to have big warning labels. I think San Francisco actually put some warning la labels on the Coke cans, you know, similar to tobacco labels. And that's probably what we need to do. Skull and crossbones on that stuff. And, and you know, at least they see it and maybe not let kids go buy it in vending machines. Yeah. I think that's an important distinction to know is like you mentioned earlier, Dr. Lustig's work is, Sugar is, by classification and what it does to the brain, it is an addictive substance and it is classified by a drug as a lot of researchers or there's been all those reports of how it is more addictive than certain other substances that are considered very dangerous. And also importantly to note, there is no biological need for refined sugar ever whatsoever. The body has no need for it that we can't get from vegetables or from fruit, pure people who eat fruit. Um, there's much better sources of this. There's truly actually no biological reason to consume sugar. And like you said, there's now a lot of data pointing the opposite direction that we should be avoiding it. Um, yet it is so acceptable and not just acceptable, it's so pushed that even as a parent with young kids now, if you don't feed your kids sugar all the time, people think that's weird. And there's a lot of social pressure to feed our kids sugar. And it's so linked. Um, I worry that it's so linked to positive life experiences that we're making that association so young for children that, like you said, every birthday party is an opportunity for sugar. Every good grade is an opportunity for sugar. Every time they go to the bank with their parent, they get sugar. It's just reinforced constantly on any kind of community or bonding experience. And I really worry long-term what kind of associations we're going to see with this and the, the drastic rates we already are seeing of so many diseases. So I'm glad that there are people like you out there educating about this. Um, unfortunately, I don't see the problem getting better unless we do start taking some measures to bring awareness and like we have with tobacco, raise awareness of how harmful it is to the body. Yeah, Robert's an amazing. He helped me with the first grant we did in medical school teaching medical students about nutrition. We based it on uh, Dr. Robert Lustig's first book, which was called Fat Chance. So he was the disruptive voice out there saying that, you know, sugar's a toxin, you know, and the dose makes the toxin. So he gave a talk, Sugar the Bitter Truth. I think it's got like 8 million YouTube videos. But he wrote a book called Fat Chance, which really explained the hormonal drivers of obesity, that this wasn't a calorie in, calorie out. And his latest book, which you mentioned there about the mind. So if any of y'all are readers or listen to Audible, get it's called hijacking of the American mind by Robert Lustig. And that explains the dopamine effect of the sugar, you know, as compared to, so that's happiness is dopamine. And then there's this other neurochemical called serotonin, which is contentment. So we always tell people they got to get rid of the dopamine type of uh, behaviors, you know, alcohol, tobacco, in my state, opiates, you know, anything that you could attach a holic to is dopamine. It's immediate reward, happy meals, reward, we've equilibrated to mean happiness in our society. But the other type of happiness is what you would get on a walk with your dog and your dog has it and you have it, right? It's content, which means I'm good, right? I'm good. I don't need, like if you're walking on the beach with your kids, right? You're good. You know, if you hear that, I'm good, you're content. So you have to find those things in your life that give you contentment. And unfortunately now so many people just don't have that in their lives. You know, they're economically challenged. They, don't have family support. They're just, they don't have anything that they can grab onto that gives them that type of happiness, contentment. So we need to try to figure out how to let people have purpose in their lives. And then maybe they can work on the sugar. I love that point. I, I've said this for a while now that I think one of the biggest problems that's not talked about enough in today's world is the movement away from 
authentic, actual community and support into this more fragmented um, social media world where we're all at odds so often, but also we're just detached from real life interaction with relationships that improve us or that help support us. And we know biologically we have such a tremendous need for that. Statistically, it's as important as quitting smoking. It's more important than exercise. We need other humans and we need good interaction. And we've largely moved away from that. So I love that you brought it back to that. And I think that's a perfect note to to end on as we start to wrap up. I'm also, as a last parting question, I'd love to hear, we've already mentioned so many amazing books and those will be linked in the show notes, but I always love to ask if there's a book or book that books that have really impacted your life. They don't have to be related to the topics we've talked about today, but I always am looking for new book recommendations. Gosh, you know, what books? I have so many. I think if you really want to understand, you know, some of the nutrition, read Nina Teicholtz. It's called Big Fat Surprise. It's a, it's a wonderful book. I would um, read that and understand it because that turns everything on its head. A book I read pretty recent that is just such an amazing story of human will was the, the story of the 1936 Olympic team rowers from Seattle um, called Boys in the Boat. So that's another just fun read. I, I like reading things. I'm working on a Ben Franklin's autobiography. Not, not as all, his biography by Walter Isaacson now. That's a long read. <laughs> you know, there's so many powerful life messages in that one. So maybe pick that one up if you got a few weeks to troll through. I'm an Air Force guy, so I think everyone should read Tom Wolfe's The Right Stuff. That got me excited about you know, flight medicine and Air Force, just that whole culture. And he just passed away, you know, a few months ago. He was probably one of the most amazing, just descriptive writers. So the right stuff, uh, Boys in the Boat, powerful read, nutrition, you uh, mentioned Tobbs, but Nina Teicholtz, I'm a good friend, and we're both, uh, you know, on the war path now trying to change the dietary guidelines for America for 2020, just so we can differentiate these people that have insulin resistance because we've been following the dietary guidelines since 1980 and it's only led to more disease. So we, we have to relook at that, you know? So if two thirds of the kids are failing school now, it's not about the kid. If, if one kid out of 30 in your school class is failing, it's probably about the kid. But if two thirds are failing, it's not about the kid, right? It's about the environment. There's something we're doing that just is not right. So we have to open all the science when we look at these dietary guidelines, which get put into schools, because that's why these kids can have chocolate milk. You know, it's not the schools are trying to do what they can with limited resources, but they, they're beholden to these guidelines, military rations. You know, now only about 25% of high school kids can even enlist in the military. You know, that's really sad because uh, that's how, you know, kids of need get, get out, right? I, I was 29 years military, so... You know, it's such opportunity lost if these kids are obese, you know, and they can't enlist in the military. So those are some policy things that people should learn about. Get involved in your community. Read my Absolutely. book because I just, yeah, put, put that on the short list. It took me five years to write the thing, but I try to summarize a lot of this stuff in 300 pages, you know, so that it really it took five years. It's like I'm trying to drill down nutrition into two chapters and then here's some references if this is interesting to you, because so many good things have been written, but how can I drill down the important things, you know, about play, children, nature, power of women. So I have a whole chapter in my book on the power of women in sport and running, you know, because women are really leading the change and getting people out in the running movement now. Over half of participants in running events now are ladies, so good on you. I love that. And I definitely, your book will be linked in the show notes or people can find it, I'm sure on Amazon or any bookstore. And I fully support your work um, and her work in getting the guide, the dietary guidelines changed. I know there have been little tiny improvements the last couple of times they updated it, but we definitely need to see some much bigger, broad changes. And I hope that you guys are successful. And if you are, we'd love to do a follow-up interview about that because like I said, I think and it's Nina would be a drastic. Great guest. She would love to come on. I can introduce you to Nina. And she's a mother also of, of two children. So Nina Teicholtz would be a, a great guest for you if you've not had her on before. That would be awesome. She's and, the expert. And... <laughs> you know, I'm part of the tribe, trying to boots on the ground, teaching this stuff to doctors, but she did 10 years of the hard research mm -hmm. to make it happen. Awesome. I love that. I appreciate her work and I appreciate 
your work and your time in being here today. I love that you are on the front lines as a doctor working with patients and trying to make these changes. And hopefully um, a lot of people listening are implementing those changes as well in their own lives and that together we'll see this pendulum start to swing the other direction. But thank you for your time and for your work. No, thank you, Katie. It's been a privilege and thank you for introducing me to your audience. Thank you. And thanks to all of you for listening and for sharing your valuable asset of time with us today. And I hope that you will join me again on the next episode of the Wellness Mama podcast. If you're enjoying these interviews, would you please take two minutes to leave a rating or review on iTunes for me? Doing this helps more people to find the podcast, which means even more moms and families can benefit from the information. I really appreciate your time and thanks as always for listening.